reminded this morning is simply to make the commitment to obey him that as we commit to obey him he takes the lead he will provide what we need and guarantee us victory you can't go wrong walking in obedience to the Lord and so tonight I want us to shift gears just a little bit and go to the book of John the book of John and we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer for just a few minutes tonight the book of John the 17th chapter John chapter 17 I understand that for many the Lord's Prayer uh, is the one listed in Matthew our Father which art in heaven I I'm good with that but I, I would rather refer to that as the model prayer as our Lord taught his disciples and every disciple since them how to pray uh, those are instructions in praying when you get to John chapter 17 this is the Lord's Prayer our Lord is in the Garden of Gethsemane he is sweating drops of blood his main disciples are asleep he has confronted them with the question could you not stay awake for one hour and so as our Lord is praying he knows all things he knows that Judas Iscariot he knows that the temple guard is on their way to the garden he knows he will be arrested he knows he will be given a mock trial he knows the next morning Pilate will wash his hands of him and will command Jesus to be nailed to a cross. And this is those final moments that our Lord has in prayer to his Father. If you knew that you were going to die, what would you pray for? You know, for some of us, we would pray for protection. We would pray that the Lord would send his angels, that they would stand guard as they did with Elisha in Dothan. You remember Elisha said, Lord, open my service eyes, and the mountains were filled with the angels of the Lord. And you would think that when we're about to go through this particular trial, that we would pray for our deliverance. And yet it is for this very thing that Jesus came the angel was correct when he said, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So as we come to John chapter 17, it's almost like an Exodus 3 kind of passage. Uh, in Exodus 3, remember the Lord said to Moses, Take your shoes off for you are standing on holy ground. When we come to John 17, we treat this chapter as though it were, in fact, holy ground. So well, how did John know what Jesus prayed? Uh, by his own admission, remember Peter, James, and John had fallen asleep. Our Lord had gone further into the garden when he prayed this prayer. How did John know? what Jesus said when we come to John 17 this is absolute direct revelation of the Holy Spirit to John that these are the words because John wasn't there to hear them remember Jesus is alone praying and as he prays you could divide his prayer up into three specific areas first and foremost of course he prayed for himself second he prayed for his disciples and third, he prayed for those who would come to know him in the years to come. So in a real, genuine, honest kind of way, when Jesus was in guard, the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying for you. He was praying for me. He was praying for those who would come to faith in me, he said. And so as we come to John 17, time doesn't permit us to deal with all of the chapter. But I do want to begin reading with verse number 15 and go to the end of the chapter. John chapter 17, 
my entire chapter other than the first couple of lines in verse 1 are all red letter. Our Lord says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, referring to his disciples, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world sanctify them set them apart by your truth your word is truth as you have sent me into the world I also have sent them into the world and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth verse 20 here's where you and I are in this chapter I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Look at what our Lord is saying. I pray for you. He prays for me. I wasn't there. I never saw him with my own eyes. I never heard him with my own ears. I never saw his miracles. But I believe the testimony of those who were. And our Lord says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their testimony, through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love which, with which you loved me may be with them and I in them. What a precious prayer for God's children. Did you catch the theme of the prayer? Not deliverance. Never did he say, Lord, save me from this hour. But he prayed for you. And he prayed for me that we may be one. The last prayer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that is recorded before the cross. He says, I pray for my children that they be one as I am one with you. When you think about the unity that our Lord prayed about, I think of the one thing that's missing in so many churches. The very thing that our Lord prayed about, so many churches never experience because they don't understand that it's not about who's in control. It's not about who's number one. The issue is all about him. I heard a preacher years ago tell a story. And his setting is, is, is in the jungle, and, and, and the mighty lion is roaring. And as he roars, he shouts, Who is the king of the jungle? And the monkey says, You are, O king. You are the king of the jungle. The lion proudly approaches a giraffe and says, 
roaring, says, Who is the king of the jungle? And the giraffe says, You, O king, you are the king of the jungle. He approached this big bull elephant, gave a mighty roar, and said, Who is the king of the jungle? The bull elephant grabbed him with his with his trunk and beat him up against the tree, threw him 40 feet in the air, and the old lion landed with a big spat. And the lion looked at the old elephant and says, just because you don't know the answer, you don't have to be so upset. <laughs> it's not about who's the king of the church. Not about who's in charge, who's the most important. The one thing that our Lord prayed about for Bayou Sarah, for Shiloh, for Satsuma, for celebration, you name it, whatever church you want to list, here's his prayer, that my children be one. That my children be one in unity. Are we one? Our Lord said that by my love, you, the world will know you're my disciples. Are we, in fact, marked by love? Does unity prevail in our church family? Our Lord prayed in five specific areas that we be unified. They're all right there in your passage. I invite you to leave your Bible open. And as you see where we are, you can just make a note. Uh, in, in 30 years from now, when I preach this sermon again, you can say, hey, I, I, I remember he preached that, and, 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 and now he's preaching it again. But five areas, seriously, that our Lord prayed that we would be one. First, he said, I pray that they are one in being sanctified. Notice, if you would, the scriptures. Beginning in verse number 15, he said, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. As I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified by truth. What in the world does it mean to be sanctified? You know, the very word saint throws us a curve. We wonder, do saints dress in black? Do, do saints wear their hair in a particular way? What does a saint look like anyway? What is our Lord praying? Lord, sanctify them through your word. What in the world is he praying? Well, first and foremost, let me define a saint for you. A saint is someone who has trusted Christ. A saint is someone who has trusted Christ. Anybody here trusted Christ? Anybody? Then how many of us are saints? Every one of us. Even those folks from Corinth, you know that, that, that Heinz 57 kind of church where, where everything goes wrong, that Murphy's Law kind of church. Have you ever noticed how Paul addressed them in chapter 1? He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the saints. Hey, they didn't act like saints. If you were to ask the folks at Corinth, they would have sworn they weren't saints. And yet God's Word says they were saints. Sometimes I don't act like a saint. Sometimes you don't act like a saint. I'm, I'm so thankful that being a saint is a positional thing, not, not a behavioral kind of thing. That because of what Christ has done in us, we belong to the family. And that we are the saints of God. And so our Lord says, my prayer is that they be sanctified. That my saints be sanctified. What does sanctified mean? Is that a procedure that we use? That if we have some miracles, we can set them aside and we can sanctify them? The word sanctify simply is the process by which Christ grows you up in your faith. I use that word intentionally because it is a process. What God started the moment he saved you, he's still at work. 
Say, well, well, I was saved when I was a little girl. I was saved when I was a little boy. I've been saved for a long time. Well, all that time, God's been at work in your life. All that time, and you're still here, which says to you and me both, he's not finished with us yet. But we do have a promise in the book of Philippians chapter 1 that he who began this good work, he will complete it. So how long is it going to take him to complete it? I think that you and I get to have a part in that, don't we? You and I get to have a part in that. You know, he is the, 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 the motor of the clay, and I'm the clay, but I can make the clay hard in his hands. As the potter molds the clay, you and I can become marred in his hand. And sometimes the very plan that he made for us to begin with is not what we end up with, not because he's not able, but because we're not willing but our Lord says, Father, sanctify them, grow them up. How's he going to do that? Through his spirit and through his word. Through his spirit and through his word. See, God specializes in recycling. God specializes in recycling all the stuff that we think it ought to be discarded and thrown in a heap pile somewhere. Our Father takes all of those things and He uses them, as we were talking a moment during my class tonight, and He molds them into something good for His children as He grows us up. Listen, you're not what you need to be. I understand that. I'm certainly not what I ought to be. But I can look back in my life as you can as well. And you can see how God is working in your life and how he is bringing you to the place that you are today. Listen, none of us is where we used to be. Now, I'm always a little bit amazed that people want to go back to their salvation experience and they want to go back to that glorious day when they met the Lord and it was a glorious day. But listen, do you really want to go all the way back and start over? Do you really want to do that? I would hate to know I had to relearn all the lessons God has taught me uh, most of them for messing up that he has taught me through my life I don't want to go back to the day I was saved I don't look back thank God I can look forward he is going to complete his work until the day of Christ Jesus so he says I want you to be one first of all in your spirit second we are to be one in our faith. Now, I'm going to go back. I didn't read this verse, but I want to point it out. Verse 6. I have manifested your name to men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 6. These early disciples, they have kept God's word, passed it on to us, and tonight we are still preaching the faith. The faith. The faith is the good news of Jesus Christ. And listen, there's a lot of things that we can compromise on. I understand that, but not here. Not here. There's no compromising what it takes for a person to be saved. There's no watering down here. The Scripture says that there is one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. And whatever church whatever fellowship, whatever assembly, whatever preacher, whatever teacher ever says that there's more ways for a person to be made right with God, they have erred from the faith and they are in dangerous ground. The Apostle Paul writing to the church of Galatia, technically the churches of Galatia. Galatia was a region, not, not a city. But he says in the book of Galatians chapter 1, I'm amazed that you have so quickly moved away from the gospel to another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. But if I or an angel or anyone else preach another gospel, then that which you have heard, let him be accursed. Again, I say as before, if anyone, an angel, a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, if anyone preaches another gospel than that of Jesus Christ, let him be a curse. There's not but one gospel. And if you've got to add works to what Jesus did, you've moved away from the truth. 
you've moved away from the reality of the good news, it ceases to be good news if I've got to keep my end of the bargain. If, if the good news is God does his part and I do my part, what happens if I don't do my part? That's not good news. That scared me to death. The good news is that Christ did it all. That Christ paid for my sin. He paid for your sin. And our Lord is praying that we be one in faith. And through these years, almost 2,000 years have passed, and we are still preaching Jesus. Still preaching there's one way to be saved. Still preaching there's no other. No other name, no other way, no other life than Jesus. Jesus said, my children are to be one in faith. Third, Jesus prays that his children will be one in fellowship. In fellowship, look at verse number 21 with me, please. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect, doesn't mean sinless, that they are complete in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus prayed that be, we be one in fellowship. The word fellowship, by the way, uh, later is used in the book of Acts as the word ecclesia. Now, now that probably impresses you, doesn't it? I hope not. Do you know what the word means? The church, the church, the called out ones, the assembly of believers. And so our Lord is praying that we be one as a family of God. Now, let me give you a better definition of fellowship. I've given it to you before, but you may have forgotten it. The best definition I know of fellowship is two fellows in a ship rowing in the same direction. I mean, how do you get more simple than that? Two fellows in a ship rowing in the same direction. Technically, the word means partnership. That we are partners together to do the work of God. It's not about my part and your part and my job and your job. It's about all of us working together. Later, as the Apostle Paul unfolded this further, he likened the, the church to a body. And he said, we're not all an eye, and we're not all an ear, and we're not all a hand, and we're not all a foot. And it is ridiculous for the hand to look down and say, hey, wish I was a foot. That's crazy. He says, well, how would that work if we were all hands? How would we walk? You know, sometimes when I read the Apostle Paul, I just have to stop and, and snigger a little bit. He says, if we were all an eye, what would we do? Roll in? who roll us? Think of the dirt you'd get in your eye if all you did roll, you rolled around as an eye. He said, you're not all an eye. If you all were eyes, who would hear? You were hands. Well, what, how would we walk? And, and, and he made that illustration to say this, that none of us can say just because you're not gifted like I am, you're not important. Of course we're gifted differently. Do you really think that God would give all his children the same gift? Do you really think that God who makes every snowflake unique, who numbers the sand on the seashore, do you really believe that God would say to his church, everybody has the same gift. I wouldn't want to be a member of that church. If that church specialized in, 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 in preaching, then who's going to teach? Who's going to serve? Who's going to minister? Who's going to the funeral homes and nursing homes if we're all gifted to preach? What if we're all gifted to teach? Well, if we're all gifted to teach, well, who's going to do those other things I just mentioned? You see, the Lord, in His divine wisdom, said, you have one gift, and you have this gift, and you have this gift, and you have this gift, and every one of us has a gift. Now, you may not have discovered what your gift is, but that's no excuse. 
you have one. If you are saved, you have a spiritual gift. And all of your gifts are to be used to glorify the Lord and grow up the church. And so when our Lord is praying about let them be one, we are one. We are in one family, but we are to function together as one body. And so everyone doesn't have the same gift. God didn't intend us to. But God did intend for you to use the gift he gave you. I've often wondered what it would be like to be part of a church where everyone used their gifts. Just use your gifts. The gifts are given through the Holy Spirit to grow up the church and to edify the Lord Jesus. What would happen if we used our gifts? I'm convinced that if we used our gifts half as much as we compare our gifts, the church would be different today. And our Lord is praying that we be one in fellowship. We're fourth. He prays that we are one in mission. Notice verse number 21 and verse 23. I in them, you and me, that they may be made perfect. Here it is. That the world may know that you have sent me. That the world may know that you have sent me. How's the world going to know if we don't tell them? How's the world going to come to faith in him if we don't tell them? Our Lord is speaking almost 2,000 years ago. Can I just say, I for one am thankful that somebody listened and that somebody told. Because somebody told somebody else of another generation and another generation and another generation and here we are in this generation and I'm so thankful somebody told you how to be saved, don't you? I'm so thankful somebody told me how to be saved. Our Lord prays that the world may come to know Him, that we understand this is our mission. Our mission is to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to others. We get so busy doing everything else that sometimes we neglect the main thing. And it's not that the things that we do are sinful. Many of them are not sinful. They're not even bad. They're just not the best. And I honestly believe that Satan busies us and he fills our calendars and he overwhelms our schedules to keep us from doing the main thing. The main thing is that the world may know that the world may come to faith in Jesus Christ. How many of us have neighbors that we know they don't know Christ? And yet our lives stay so hectic and so busy and running so here and there and everywhere else that we drive right by them every single day without ever stopping to tell them about Jesus. We live in the same world. We get overwhelmed with all of the stuff. And yet Jesus prays for us just before he goes to Calvary that we be one in mission. That we may understand that just because we reach our one, our job's not over. Then we go after our two. And after we reach our two, we go after our four. And after we go after our four, we continue after our six. Prayerfully, we told you this was going to be a year-long event. Our prayer is that it is a lifetime event. That we never get over the fact that people are lost. We never quit praying. We never quit sharing the good news in Jesus. That we be one. Finally. Our Lord prays that we be one with Him in glory. Now notice the text, if you will, please. Verse number 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me. Is that you? 
John 10 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. You know these verses. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. My Father which gave them to me. You know the verse? So you're a gift from the Father to the Son. Verse 24, Father, I desire that those whom you have given me do what? Do what? Behold my glory. Now, I'm surprised that Jesus didn't pray. Lord, let every one of them live to be 110. Joshua did. We dealt with him this morning. 110 years old. I love his testimony. Not a word that God promised has failed to come to pass. Now you choose this day whom you'll serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But Jesus didn't pray that we live to be old, did he? Would Jesus pray that we behold him in his glory? Where is he in his glory? This is not a trick question in heaven. The disciples stood on the mount and as he ascended into heaven, the angel said, Why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus that you see going will come again one day. And for almost 2,000 years, every generation of genuine believers has looked for his coming. Prayerfully, you're looking for his coming too. And listen to the prayer that Jesus prays. Father, I pray that those who you have given to me be with me and behold me in my glory. Now, to me, that changes the whole way I look at death. Because from our perspective, death is an enemy. Death is a separation. Death is an end. All those words describe death. But to Jesus... How does he look at death of his children? A prayer answered. A prayer answered, Father, it is my desire that those you have given me be with me and behold me in my glory. And so up to this point in our life, the Lord hasn't returned. So one by one by one by one we're leaving. And on this side, it's a tearful, see you later. It's a sorrowful event when we lose those that we love and we care for. But from our side, what looks like the end from their side is just the beginning. From our side, what looks like a departure from their side is an eternal hello. From our side, what looks like a time of grief for them is an answer to prayer. Every one of them who've gone home have been with Jesus and have beheld his glory. And listen, unless Jesus returns one day, you're going home too. Unless Jesus returns one day, I'm going home. Folks going to walk by and say, my, my, doesn't he look good? No, he looks dead. Oh, he's dead. Don't you believe a word of it. For the child of God, we're more alive than we've ever been before because we're going to be with Jesus and be at home. Our Lord prayed, Father, my will is those that you've given me. Be with me and behold my glory. So what are the saints doing tonight in heaven? not night there by the way what are they doing in heaven they're beholding his glory I'm excited about seeing the folks when I get to heaven I want to hug my mama I want to hug my daddy I want to hug my family members my loved ones those folks that God's brought into my life through our years of ministry that have stood by us and prayed for us and loved us and supported us and, and it, <coughs> it's going to make it heaven to see Jesus. To see Jesus. Cannot wait to see Jesus. Peter said, you haven't seen him. 
but you rejoice with exceeding great joy. And the end of your faith is going to be the salvation of your soul one day, one day for you and for me, unless Jesus returns. The Father is going to answer this prayer, and you're going to be the answer that my children whom you have given to me be with me and behold me in my glory. Every child of God who goes home is a promise kept and an answered prayer. No wonder the psalmist, before he ever knew that John 17 would be written, in Psalm 116 said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now we understand why. Because we're going home to be with Jesus and behold him in his glory. That we be one. Not successful. Not blessed with material goods. Not have everything the world has to offer. That was never his prayer. But his prayer is that we be one in spirit, in fellowship, in faith, in mission, and one day, thank God, in glory. Would you bow with me, please? Have you trusted him? Has there been that time in your life that you've given your heart to him? If not, you can this evening. And then for us who have, what joy to know that our Father, our Father, still answers prayer. He answered the prayer of His Son. He answers yours. He answers mine. Oh, that we be one in Him. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to this passage tonight, and Lord, we hear our Savior pray for us. Lord, thank You for hearing His prayer and our prayer. Lord, I pray that we will be one. That we will love one another the way you taught us to. Put others first like you taught us to. To walk in humility like you taught us to. And Lord, thank you that you're at work in our lives. And you will continue to work until you call us home. Father, help us to trust you. To rest in you to be faithful to you until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand with me, would you please? The words or invitation are on the screen. We invite you to come as we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. I invite our ushers to come at this time. Our, our young men who have been taking our offering, uh, they are in the building next door. So we're back to the old folks. <laughs>